Um, what we're going to be doing today, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, um, some basics in real estate. So we're just kind of giving you an overview of what we're doing. I'm going to show you how to, some things you got to think about to get started. Okay, um, we're going to talk about different strategies in real estate. We're going to do some case studies, and we got some printouts for you. Okay, but before we do that, I kind of want to introduce my team real quick. Um, first of all, my name is Aaron Haga, uh, principal broker here at, Sto at Stonebrook, and been investing in real estate and doing all that kind of stuff for nearly 20 years now. I have bought and sold hundreds of properties. I've done hundreds of flips, and that's no exaggeration, of single family homes. And I've done hundreds of small apartments to the largest one that I have done was a 21 plex. And so um, that's my experience. I do a lot of value add properties, which means I buy properties, raise rents, remodel them, whatever, increase the value, and either sell them, refinance them, and keep them, or sometimes a little bit of both. Okay, so, and, and my, kind of my mission, the reason why I do these seminars is um, I used to fly around the Western United States and I used to teach programs. And they would pay me to do that and we would charge a lot of money to have people do that. Um, and then I created my own and did that as well and I found that the, the success rate was abysmal. It's less than 3%. And I really had a hard time with that. So I started, I said, no longer am I going to charge for it. I'm going to teach people for free. I'm going to show them how to do it. And then I'm going to help design programs to help them be successful. And I found the people that engage with me in that level, they are, almost all of them are successful if they follow the program that I create for them. So we're going to start with a couple. We're going to do some case studies where I'll show you where you can start at any level and show you the benefits of how real estate investing will work for you, okay? So, but first of all, let me introduce Kelly. Kelly's back there, she's my right arm, and she, uh, um, she runs everything here in the office and uh, does a ton of uh, entitlement work and a lot of stuff on the investment side, and uh, she does a great job for us. Uh, Cody, back there, he is a sales arm, so a lot of you will be working, if you, if you decide to, to work in real estate or buy something or do anything that way, you'll be working with Cody in, in some respect, okay? And then I've got Nolan back there as well. Nolan has been doing my financing and my loans for 15 plus years, right? And he still helps me, he does a lot of commercial stuff now and he still helps me on the residential stuff and kind of helping us there. Uh, Ryan Tucker there in the back. So not all of your assets can be in real estate, right? And that's why Ryan's here. So Ryan's my financial advisor on things not real estate. And he is excellent, a brilliant mind in that. And then I've got Roy back there. And Roy is my project manager. And so on all the value add projects or any kind of flips, if you guys have us involved at all, Roy will be involved in that as well, okay? And Jamie showed up. She probably, she's actually our title lady. She's awesome, does a great job over a Cottonwood title, okay? And then this is my boy, Ashton. I told him to be really good. He wanted to come. And this is my nephew, Luke. So if they mess around, you guys can all smack them around a little bit, all right? Anyway, but, so let's get, let's get started a little bit. And, uh, but before we do, let me get a couple questions. What are you hoping to learn tonight? We've got an hour and a half. Okay, what, were you, what are you hoping to learn tonight? Let's write that up so we make sure that we cover that. Careful, nobody, not everyone speak at once. Okay. How to choose a good property. We'll talk about that. How to make money. Okay. How to finance. What else? 
see how you could help us who become a real estate investor. Partner up well, with. Who and how to partner up with? We'll just go partners. Question. What was yours? See how you could help us become real estate investors. All right. How I help. Okay. Anything else? All right, I'm going to put world, world solve world hunger up there, and we'll get to that too. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, all right. So let's get uh, um, let's get in it. So real estate um, has been a passion of mine for a long time, and it started, and in fact, value add real estate specifically, it started when I was a little kid. I remember one of my buddies, his name is Andy Jacobson, and we were, we were friends all through elementary and, and junior high and high school, and I was over at his house, I think I was in third or fourth grade, and we were playing He-Man. Does anybody remember He-Man? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Power of Gray School. So, anyway, so I, uh, um, we were playing He Man's and we were building these little, like, our own little base with Legos and stuff like that. Well, I built mine, I thought it was pretty cool, and he built his and he did this, like, double decker thing. And I'm like, dang, I remember the, the feeling then. I thought, that is awesome. And why didn't I think of that? That's exactly how I thought. And ever since that point, I started to look at property all the time differently from just that young age. And I started to look at different properties. I would walk through friends' houses and I would think, well, that's weird. Why do you have to walk through this room to get to that room, et cetera? Okay, and so that's, that's kind of what got me really thinking about real estate. I didn't realize that until I got older and I started to, I really gravitated towards projects that needed work. That's something that I always did. And in, in so doing, I came up with a couple strategies. I wanted to simplify things. So my background, I've got a degree in economics and I've got a master's degree in real estate development, both from the University of Utah, okay? And in my economics class, one of my, one of my favorite teachers, Professor Jameson, he was teaching Macroeconomics 101 and he was talking about the trade deficit, which if anybody follows the news, the financial news, that's the big deal with the whole trade wars going on and uh, tariffs and et cetera, all that stuff to try and balance that out. And back then, this was, I mean, God, over a decade ago, um, they talked about our trade deficit and what it was and, and why we had one and, and the problems with it. Anyway, and he started talking about that and then he started talking about Social Security and how screwed up that was. And then he started talking about how the government spent money and how they were constantly borrowing money and all this stuff. And as a kid, I thought there, I sat there and I looked at it and I raised my hand. I said, hey, Professor Jamison, this is awesome to know all this stuff. I go, but how does the normal person protect themselves against the government ills, against all of this other macroeconomic data? And he said, he said, Aaron, first of all, most economists are poor. And if we knew the answer to that, we'd all be rich, <laughs> right? So I, from, and that really, I remember that really bothered me. And so I thought, well, how do I figure this out so I don't have to worry about all those different things? And that's where these strategies came up with. So number one in getting started in real estate. So when you're starting to um, figure out how to find a good property, when you want to look at how to make money at all, how to finance partners, everything, it starts with what are you looking for, first of all, number one. And it all is about strategy. So whether you want to do a short-term strategy, whether you want to grow your money fast, whether you want to do a mid-term strategy, which most, most beginner investors, I don't recommend mid-term strategies. The reason why mid-term strategies have everything to do with economic trends. So if you could have predicted that our market was going to increase in such great value over the last eight years, would you have bought a lot of property in 2009, 2010? Yeah, but you've got to be able to predict that, and then you also need to make sure you're sustainable during that time in case you're wrong, right? So the next thing is long-term strategies. Long-term strategies are the easiest. It's all about having a full economic cycle. So when we look at strategies, we're not going to go into strategies too much today, but we are going to just go into them briefly. So short-term strategies all need to be done within one year, okay? 
That is the sexy thing of real estate. Everybody wants to flip. Everybody wants to just make a ton of money real quick, take their 20,000, go watch HGTV, go buy a property, and then turn that into 150 in a year, right? Because on Flip That House or Flip Vegas or whatever, they do it every single damn day. So why can't we? Well, it's a little harder than that, OK? So it's a lot more difficult to do that. Um, but that is a strategy I employ, and I do that. One thing to consider is this. Short-term strategies by far are the most risky strategies in real estate. And people always say, well, hold on a minute. My brother bought this house, and he lost his shirt on da 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 At the end of the day, short-term has everything to do with speculation of some sort. And we have to make a lot of assumptions in short-term real estate. We also tend to use other types of money that are a lot more risky, whether that is hard money or alternative financing. So short-term strategies are by far the riskiest strategies. Okay. Um, Midterm. Midterm strategies are two to five years. They're all about economic trends. So what's going on in the market? What's going to happen? I love midterm strategies, and this is why you can make money when the market's going up, when it's going down, or when it's sideways. It does not matter what's happening. What matters is your forecasting. And that's why midterm strategies tend to be a little more risky for folks, especially in the beginning because it has to do with forecasting. And how many people are right all the time? Except for me. No? Well, let me tell you, from my experience, I'm not all right all the time. I'm very open and honest about this. I lost everything in the real estate crash of 2008, 2009. I had to sell all of my properties. I sold my, I lost my house. I, everything I lost, I had to restart all over and redo everything, okay? I did everything I could to stay out of bankruptcy. I paid everybody off as much as I could, and then I was left with over $100,000 of debt. And why do I share that? Because you learn a hell of a lot more from your losses than you do your gains. And I can tell you right now, it made me a way better investor going through that. From that time, so when I, since I started rebounding, my portfolio is now over $10 million in rental real estate of my portion that I own after all my partnerships. And so do I have that much equity? No, I have debt on that. But I've rebounded that much since that time. And I put myself in a very stable position. But it's really important that you know that. And one of the biggest problems that put me into that situation was not understanding that. And I've got a background in economics, guys, and I missed it. I was blinded by greed and other things. We'll talk about that later, OK? But so it's important that you understand if you're going to go into midterm strategies, you really understand what you're doing there. And that, frankly, in my opinion, you make sure that it can go long term if you're wrong. And if you do that, you're always going to be safe. Long term is the not sexy. It is the Toyota Camry of real estate, all right? It is the 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 Toyota Prius, whatever is like the most boring car you can think of, that's it. But I don't know a single real estate flipper who does this up here that is wealthy. I know a lot of them that make good income, but I know a lot of real estate investors that are very wealthy because of long-term strategies. Okay. And so that's what we're going to focus on today. I'm going to show you that, how it works, and, and how easy it really is to make a lot of money in real estate. All right? Strategy merging, we get into that. I do an entire class. In fact, entire, I did an entire month long of classes just on strategies and strategy merging alone. And so we're going to do some of that as well. All right? All right, so um, I love this little cartoon. But this is true. OK, everybody, so this is, this is what happens. I can, every single time, it's predictable. And for some of you that have been in my office and had interviews with me and kind of building a strategy, you'll know this, OK? Um, I always ask, well, what are you looking for in real estate? I just want a good deal. And I, and I chuckle inside. I'm like, well, what's a good deal? And they're like, well, I don't know. That's why I'm hoping that you could help me find a good deal. I'm like, but nobody knows what is a good deal. Okay, 
So would this be a good deal to you if you bought a duplex for, let's say you put $20,000 down, it made you, they, they, the seller carried the contract at 4.5% and you had to pay them off in five years. Okay, so you had to get a new loan in five years. And you bought that with a renter in it and you're going to cash flow about $50 a month. And your loan to value on that, it's, you're buying it for 280 and the, the property's worth 320. Would you do that? Probably not. Okay. Why? And how do you know? I don't. That's a very good, no, it's really important. This is why. <laughs> the vast majority of people in real estate have no clue what they're talking about when they do it. They focus in on one specific aspect. They either focus in on cash flow. So I have a, I have a very good friend that sells a lot of property out of the state of Utah. All right. And in fact, they focus on properties where the cap rates or the rate of capitalization or your cash flow is higher than anywhere else in the country. So that's really the Midwest is where they focus. And um, over in the, in the, oh, I guess the, wherever the grapes of wrath came from and all of that area, the Dust Bowl, okay? All of that stuff. And what happens is they say, well, we like the cash flow. We're getting 8% on our money. And I tell them, well, the thing is, your appreciation rate was 1.5% over the last 20 years. 1.5% a year, which is less than inflation. So and by cash flow, did you mean $50 above and beyond all expenses? Yes, yeah. So, I'm gonna, yeah. so here's the thing. You're not wrong. You're not right. What's important is I'm going to teach you how to think about it, OK? So what do they miss? The, one of the biggest benefits of real estate, which I'm going to prove to you today, is appreciation and being in markets that grow, being in areas that grow. Appreciation will trump cash flow every single time. So if I'm walking into a property and I've got $40,000 of equity from day one, okay, and I make $600 a year or $50 a month on my $20,000 investment, that's like 3% cash on cash return on that $20,000, right? That's not very exciting at all. But when I look at, OK, I put 20000 down and I got 40000 in equity immediately, what return is that? 300, right? So I tripled my money there. I get my money back plus 40000 more if I sell it from day one. So you start averaging that in there. And now you're like, wow, that's a great deal. I would do that. Because you could sell it tomorrow and make a, re a really great return on your money, right? You could wait to sell it for two years and, be and make a really great return on your money. But again, it all depends on your strategy. What is your strategy? If your strategy is to build cash flow and as much as possible, that may not be the deal for you, right? It comes down to what you're trying to accomplish, not just asking what's a good deal. I just want a good deal, right? We need to know and we need to be able to define what a good deal is for you particularly. So I've helped people who are in their 60s, even 70s, getting into real estate and being successful. I've helped people who are, have quite a bit of real estate and change their portfolio and, and optimize it and everything else. And I've helped people young, get started and do all of that. And every strategy is really different for all kinds of different people based upon their situation, OK? And what they're trying to accomplish. All right. So again, knowing exactly what you're looking for is the most important, defining your strategy. The thing is, you're always going to find what you're looking for. And if you don't know what you're looking for, what are you going to find? Nothing. Nothing. And I see that all the time. All right. OK, so again, I'm drive this home. What comes first? The chicken, I love that little thing. Anyway, so strategy first, OK? Strategy will always define your investment parameters. Now strategy, here's the other thing that I find when I meet with people every single time, OK? Nobody thinks far enough into the future. There was a study done by an Ivy League college. I can't remember which one. It was Harvard or Princeton or something like that. 
Anyway, they did this years ago when they had computer, when the, soft, the computer software came out where they could do digital imaging of what you would look like when you were, when you were you know, 40 years from now. I tell my son, I say, hey, enjoy your hair now because look in the mirror, buddy. This is what you got going for you. Anyway, but so they, so they did this and they took a group of students. They took half the group and they put them in front of this digital, this, this, this software and they made them look like they were, because they're all in their early 20s or late, late teens, like 19 to 22 in college, right? And they're undergrad. And they made them look at themselves when they were 65, what they would look like. And they had them just stare. All they did was say, stare at that photo for a certain amount of time, okay? And then they took the other one, the other group, and they had them stare at a mirror. And then they followed them for, for a number of years. What they found was this. The people who um, looked at themselves, a digital image of themselves when they were older, they, had, they saved vastly a lot more money than the people who didn't, who just looked in the mirror. And they concluded that the vast majority of people, the reason why they don't save or prepare for the future is because they can't picture themselves old. They can't picture themselves in a different situation, okay? And how many of us, even now, I'm 41, okay, I've been working on getting in shape and everything else, and I go to the gym, and I'm like, I feel like I'm 18 until I get on the treadmill, and I feel like I'm 90, right? So, but that's, that's kind of how in our mind we think we're younger than we really are, right? When I heard this study, which was well over a decade ago, I did this visualization. I started to think about myself really old, and I'd put myself in these weird situations. My wife, she, she always catches me in my daydreams, okay? So my wife, she'll see me, whatever, I don't know what happens. I gloss over or whatever. And she's like, what are you thinking? And I'm like, it's private. <laughs> so I don't want to tell her. She's made me tell her. It's been kind of embarrassing a few times. But we all do it. But I started to visualize myself when I was older, what I wanted when I was older. When I was 65, 70, 80, 85, I even decided how long I want to live. All this, all this stuff, whether that happens or not, I don't know. But I've, I've really gone through a lot of stuff that way, and I've done that for a very specific purpose. It's to get really, really clear on what I want, what I want to do. I visualized paying for vacations for my family and their kids and all my grandkids and everything and being able to be together as a family and what that would cost me and what I have to do to be able to do that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And that has helped shape many of my decisions throughout the years. And so the one thing, you've got to think long, long term and be very, very realistic, not realistic, but very clear about what you want. Because we cannot define the strategy without that long term number. Nothing else matters until I have what that is. And that number is defined by what you want to do, right? So. How many people want to make $100,000 a year every single year all the time or more? Okay, I hope everybody's hands go up because it said or more, so you can do more than that. All right, how many people want to retire on half of that? Could, but do you want, you, I didn't ask you if you could because we all could because most people retire on Social Security and they make it, right? How many people want to? I would hope that you're here because you don't, right? So that's kind of what I want to talk about. Like, without really getting clear about what you want, then the market and life and everything that you're taught will dictate to you what will happen, right? OK. So know your options. Number one. We need to look at, in order to build a strategy and to figure out how to get started in real estate, the first thing we do is we look at all of your assets, what you have. Now, assets are tangible and intangible, okay? So home equity or other properties they may have, cash on hand, investment accounts, 401ks, IRAs, brokerage accounts, life insurance, et cetera, credit, job, et cetera, partners, family, et cetera. Maybe you're just a great salesperson. You can go knock doors for hours on end, and it doesn't bother you. And maybe that's a great talent of yours. I don't know. But we look at all of them, all the tangible and intangible benefits that you have and the assets that you bring to the table to build that strategy, right? So that's the first thing we have to do. 
After that, it's all about financing options. So, financing options, I can't stress how important it is to know this. When I first started in real estate, um, I, I, I bought my first deal, and after I bought my first deal, I got my license, okay? And then I took two weeks, because I, I had a little bit of money, and I, I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really learn this. And I sat in the lender's office for two solid weeks. I literally, they had, they had a small little office that was a quarter of the size of this room, and there was two of them in there, the main loan officer and his assistant. They had two chairs, and it was really scrunched, and I was in the corner. And I sat there for eight hours a day for two solid weeks. <laughs> and I would talk to them, and we just da da da. And I don't know why they let me, maybe because I was giving them business, but they let me sit there, and I asked them question after question after question after question after question. And Nolan knows this, right? Every deal I have, I, I call Nolan and I say, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to set it up this way. And I'll say, what about this? What about this? Do I have this option, this option, this option? And I ask question after question after question after question. I need to know my options, right? Real estate strategies are what you're trying to figure out with the property is nothing more than a big equation. And the more, the more variables I can get the answers to, the, the easier and the more accurate my, my solution is going to be, right? So, and that's how I found out about all the options at that particular time in, in, in real estate, in financing, as I sat in that office for two weeks. And I learned about LTV, CLTV, and the interest rates, and all the kind of different alternate doc programs, and full doc, et cetera, and all these different things, and all the acronyms that are out there, and I just gobbled it all up. And with that, from that time, from that meeting, okay, and two years later, I had bought over $2 million of real estate based upon that. One of them was a 21-plex that me and my business partner bought with no, mon with no money down. We paid $11,000 in closing costs because we knew the financing options, right? Okay. So, all right, with that, Nolan, I'm going to have you come up, and he's going to talk to you a little about some of the financing options. And then I'm gonna, he's going to take about five minutes. And then after that, we're going to kind of bring this all together and go over some case studies, all right? Hey, yeah. all right so things I'm going to talk to you about, you want to take good notes on these types of things. The, we're going to start with stuff that's inside the box. The, the first topics are going to be the things that you traditionally hear. How much down payment do you need? What kind of loan to values can you get? So in the box type financing. Uh, most of that done is, is through Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, you've probably heard of those companies. Conventional loans, right? This is, this is not government backed stuff, this is just conventional loans. Now traditionally, if you were just to go buy an investment property, you wanna go buy a house and use it as a rental, how much down payment do you have to have? Any guesses out there? Not, if you wanna buy it as an investment property, yeah, 20% is closer. It's actually 15% if it's a house. If it's two or more units, it's 25% down. This is usually the biggest barrier for getting started. So to buy an investment property, a house, you need 15% down. That's a lot of cash. So a $300,000 a house, you're looking at $45,000 as a down payment. That's a really big barrier. Now, if it's a $400,000 fourplex, it's $100,000 down. That's traditional financing. Other things, uh, you do expect higher interest rates. So right now, if you're owner-occupied, you're somewhere in the four and a half, four and five eighths, four and three quarters range right there. Uh, when you're running your numbers for traditional financing, you're about at least 1% higher in rate because it's an investment property. Sometimes as much as one and a half percent higher rate because of investment properties. Uh, fourplex, twoplex to fourplex, there just isn't as big of a market for them, so they have higher rates and higher down payments. Now, if you want to do it as refinances, and this is where Aaron has really done a lot of magic. A refinance has nothing to do with the current financing that's on the property. It's about just getting on title. You find your way onto the title of a property. Now it's a refinance. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac says that if you can get on title, 
you can refinance based on the appraised value, not necessarily your down payment. That's one of the secrets for getting into, uh, getting into real estate. How do you find yourself on title? What, what are some of the strategies you can do there? And Aaron's gonna cover a little bit more with that. That's one of the tricks to it. Now, I wanna be very careful about something because I didn't quite put it on the board here and I should have put it on here. That is, if you buy something on contract, who knows what that means when you buy a house on contract? Aaron actually mentioned it. Seller financing, right. Seller financing is considered the same thing as a, as a type of purchase for the first 12 months. So if you, if you seller finance a property without a down payment, you have to hold that property for 12 months before you can refinance, right? So you gotta plan ahead for, on that one. If you have a standard down payment and do seller financing, no big deal. But if you simply seller finance with a small down payment, five, $10,000, and you've got to hold that property for 12 months before you can plan on refinancing. Now, if you buy using something like hard money, who knows what hard money is, right? You know, private money, um, cash from an uncle, uh, there are lots of private money lenders out there. If you use private money or hard money, you can refinance the day after the purchase based on the appraisal. So what does that mean? If you find a really good deal, right? Everyone wants a good deal. If you find a really good deal that has lots of equity built into it, you can use that equity the day after you take out a hard money loan. Uh, cash out refinances, that's for what we call, no cash out refinance, called a rate and term refinance. That's, those are the ones you can do a day after, uh, day, after, day after acquisition. If you want to do a cash out refinance, so it is possible, I, and I, I help people all the time with this, it is possible to buy a house, you put some money into it to fix up, six months later get all of your money back because the fix up, the value add that you do to the property, making it worth more, it, it can be, it, it is possible to be six months into a property and get all of your investment back out of that property. But you have to hold on to it for six months before you try. Any, no cash out transactions within six months, okay? Now, if you want to get into commercial property, commercial property is five units and higher. We're talking about multifamily. And commercial property is also anything like retail, um, small business, uh, industrial. You know, it has uh, all kinds of food groups there for industrial, uh, for commercial. Um, commercial is a completely different animal. It, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult. Uh, for one, commercial lenders always require that you have skin in the game. You can never do 100% financing. It takes a really long time. You have to hold that property for a long time before you can try to get your money back out of it. Commercial lenders want to make sure that you are tied to that property by having cash down. And it's 25%. You just won't get out of it. No matter what, no matter what you do, you won't get, get out of that. Um, they normally do not come with 30-year fixed mortgages. They're 25-year amortizations with 10-year fixed. And that's about the longest you can fix a small commercial property. There are really, if you're talking about a 20, $30 million project, you can get 30 and 40 year fixed loans for really big projects. Um, some of that financing takes 18 months to do. Just, in, you know, I don't think that's anyone in this room, is it? No one's raising their hands. So that's probably not you guys, but if you're talking about small, like five, six plexes, uh, just plan on, you're going to have to have 25% of that pro into that project. 25% uh, of your own cash into that, into that property. Uh, beyond that, I'm going to hand the pointer right. back to Aaron. Okay, no, and I'm going to respectfully disagree okay. on the commercial side. There are banks that will do all kinds of crazy stuff on commercial side, but you've got to find the right ones. Okay, but for the vast majority of it, he's absolutely right. But we're not going to talk about that today. But. Uh, what, what, what I do want to talk about, though, let's, uh, I want to share kind of a, a funny story, first of all, okay? This will tell you a lot about my personality, okay? Um, the, other th the, the other thing I want you to do is this. Get this in your mind. Once you have a strategy figured out, be willing to execute immediately when you find the right deal. When it fits your strategy, don't second guess, just go, right? 
Okay, you know how I, I share with you all about my weird daydreaming about my life and how it's going to work? Okay, so I did that with people have, this is, this is, I shouldn't even, you can't record this, man. It's okay. Anyway, so um, I thought about my wife, like the kind of woman I wanted to marry, and I got really specific about what I wanted, right? Met my wife, and we started dating, and how many people have these, have dated their, dated their spouse for six months? Raise your hand. How many people dated him for a year? How many people dated him for six years? <laughs> so, uh, you too, okay, great, awesome. So there's nothing wrong with that, right? I dated my wife for six weeks, and uh, when I knew she was the right one, we were engaged. Literally, I was like, so it went from, I want to date other people, to the next day, saying, we should get married, and we were engaged. So it was kind of weird. Anyway, um, and then we were married six weeks later. So it's three months, and it'll be 20 years this year. All right? So the one thing about me, when I do have a plan, when I make my mind up, I will do it. Right? I don't wait. And I want you to get that in your mind, too, when it comes to real estate, OK? So let's talk about these case studies. Let's hand out the case studies, guys. Um, the first one is not in this packet, OK? So now this, this case study is absolutely true. This person was 22 years old, no savings, made $9 an hour at his job, and his wife made $11 an hour, no partners or family help, wanted to buy a rental property of some type, and had absolutely no experience in rentals at all. So, with your vast knowledge, your collective knowledge in here in real estate, what do we do with this person? Get a partner? That's an option. Okay, what else? I think you got to know his finance. You gotta know his finance? Finance? Credit's brand new, is less than a year old. Okay, what else? Huh? Hard money's an option, yep. Okay, credit was good, but really young, okay. Okay, this was me when I started, guys. So this is what I did. Remember how I said I told you I sat in that loan office? There's two different things back then when I started in 1999. And the first place I bought, there's a LTV is loan to value, okay? So that's, so if you have a loan of, uh, of 75,000 and the value of your property is 100 grand, you're at a 75% loan to value or LTV, right? There's something called CLTV, which is combined loan to value. So if you have a first and a second, what that combined loan to value is and what banks will do. At that particular time, banks were willing to go up to 100% CLTV all day long. They didn't care. But they, the first wanted to be at 80 or 75, and the second could be at whatever, OK? And money was flowing free, and, and so you know, there's a lot of second mortgages out there. They didn't care where the source came from either. So what I did is, again, I found out what the, what the financial climate was. I found the right seller. I found a seller. I bought a triplex, and I had the seller carry back my down payment, all of it, in second position behind the first. For those of you who know real estate, Michael, would you do that? Yes, that would be a great deal. Yeah, would you, would you carry back the money, though, in oh, second okay. position? Would I carry back in second position? Um, yeah, I, I think so. All right, Jamie? <laughs> Jamie's done the foreclosures, right? So <laughs> she's like, no way. All right, so it's a risky position, right? This is why, in second position, if I stop paying the second mortgage or the first mortgage, the second mortgage, to, in order to foreclose, whoever starts first, if the first starts first, then the second mortgage has to pay off the first and take that position, right? So if you have a $30,000 second mortgage and there's a, there's a $250,000 first ahead of you, and you're a dude that has a $30,000 second mortgage and maybe 10 grand in the bank, what's the odds of you being able to pay off that, that 250? Not very good, right? Okay, 
I didn't know any better. I had no idea. I didn't even know the difference between first and second position when I started. Sometimes ignorance is a good thing. So I talked to him. I was like, hey, let's do this. And if you do this, we can do it. And he's like, oh, OK, well, what are you going to pay me? And anyway, um, so it worked out. We, have, we put it all together. I bought that triplex. I turned it into a fourplex. A year and a half later, I made my first 50000 in real estate off of that deal. Okay? And it also started a partnership that I did um, with Cody's father-in-law. And we bought millions of dollars of property for the next 10 years together. We did lots of different things together, right? And the reason why it worked with Tron, his name, his, his name was Tron, by the way, was he did seller financing on his first deal. So he's got an interesting story, and um, I'm sure he'll be fine with me sharing it. When he was young, he was going, he's from Norway, and he was going to school here in, in, uh, at the U, okay, for a degree in mechanical engineering. And he had a job at Chuckarama. For those of you who know Salt Lake City, Chuckarama is a pretty well-known restaurant, right? So he was a waiter there. And <laughs> this is Tron, when he was younger, I could only imagine how naive he was then, because I know how he was when we were partners. So anyway, but these young couples would come in. And they would be eating and you know, middle of the day and just taking time off. And he asked him, he's like, how can you guys take this time off in the middle of the day? Don't you have to work? And they said, well, we're kind of semi-retired. And so he started to ask them how. And they started telling about real estate. That's what they owned. They bought a lot of rental real estate. So, so he got this $5,000 student loan from Norway that he didn't need to cover his tuition. So he had five grand. And so what he did is he started back then with the paper. The internet literally wasn't a thing, OK? So the paper, they put classified ads in for all the different rentals. And he'd call for an entire year. He called every single rental in, in the paper. And this is what he'd say. He'd go ring, 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 and they'd say, hello? Say, hi, my name is Tron. I was looking at your property you have listed in the paper. Oh, great. I'm really interested in buying it. And they would get really excited. Oh, awesome. I've got $5,000. Will you carry the contract? No, click, no, click, no, click for an entire year till one guy said yes. And he bought his first fourplex, right? And so that's how it worked out with Tron. So he had an experience with that that was positive, And so he did it for me. And it worked out for him as well, right? Anyway, that was one way to get started. I've helped a lot of people with no credit, bad credit, whatever it may be, get started as well. All right, let's look at your case study too. What I promised you is this. How to choose a good property. So how do we choose a good property? What's the answer? Know what you're looking for, right? If you don't know what you're looking for, you don't know how to choose a good property, period. You got to know what you want, OK? So it all depends on what you're looking for. How to make money, we're going to show you right now. How to finance, we talked a little bit about that, a lot of the conventional ways, OK? Partners, okay, picking the right partner again comes back to what you're trying to accomplish and what your assets are, if you need a partner or not. Okay? The other thing with real estate, it can be very expensive to get started. So a lot of real estate investors, in fact, very successful and very wealthy ones, will take partners for a very specific reason. And they do it to spread out their exposure. Okay? So if they've got a million dollars to invest, if they, would they want to put all of their million dollars in one property? Or would they like to spread that out with maybe 10? OK? And they'll bring in, the, they'll do it for that reason. All right? And then how can I help? We're going to get there. All right. Case study two. So you look on the front there. OK? What we're going to do, this is, this is the person that we're talking about. Case study, they have $50,000 in accessible home equity. That's the only thing they've got. Excellent credit, little cash on hand, good job and income, no experience, 35 years old. Okay? So we figured out, what do we want to do? First of all, what's the goal? Their goal that I made up for this is they want to have $5,000 per month free and clear at age 70, above and beyond, from real estate. Okay? So 35 years to do this. Okay? Options. They want, they want a very conservative, we could do a conservative long-term plan, we could do a short-term growth plan, we could flip homes and make our own syndication and sell it to HGTV and be a star. Okay, so we could do that. Or we could do mid-term, mid 
with what we talked about, but again, only if it fits in long term. I think it's too risky, especially for this one. So no experience. How do they do it? What do they do? So there's a couple different things. First of all, you need to know this. Memorize this. Take a picture with your phone. This is by far the most important calculation you'll ever know in your life. Okay? Maybe not the most important. But the other, the other one is yes, ma'am, to your wife. That's the, that's the most important. This is the second most important. Okay, so this is how we evaluate um, real estate, rental real estate. So cap rate is a rate of return. So out there, think of rental real estate like any business, like anything. If you're going to invest your money, what, does a, what do all investors in that space want to make on their money on that particular investment? Okay, That's what cap rate is. So if you have $100,000 and you're going to buy a $100,000 property and the market is saying that, hey, everybody's willing to accept a 5.5% rate of return on that $100,000 to buy that duplex, then that's what the rate of return is. That is what your cap rate is. Okay. So value times cap rate equals net operating income. That's the most important thing you need to know. And you've got to know how to do the inverse of this, of this equation. If you're not great at math, practice, 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 because you need to know this backwards and forwards, OK? Wouldn't you say, Nolan, by far? This is the, this is the most common valuation tool there is. Yeah, OK. Now, when we're talking about single family homes, it, is, it doesn't go into play, okay? We're going to use it for our purposes, but the value is not derived by a cap rate, okay? It has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with comparable sales, what buyers are, are willing to buy it for, okay? All right, so value times cap rate equals net operating income. So knowing that, this is how it works. So here's our goal. All right, so I want $5,000 a month free and clear in 35 years. You think that's possible? Yeah, you would think, right? Pretty easy. Okay. Well, here's what we got. So $5,000 times 12 equals 60,000. Why did I do that? Because this cap rate formula is all based on annual numbers. So we have to work on annual numbers. So 5,000 a month times 12 months equals 60,000 a year, all right? 60,000, here's the inverse of that calculation. Value times cap rate equals net operating income. So our net operating income, if the property is free and clear, is the exact same thing as our cash flow. Our net operating income is the exact same thing as our cash flow if it is free and clear. Okay? Now debt service or your loan has nothing to do with the valuation of property at all. Why is that? It's an expense, okay. It is an expense, but why would debt service have, why do we take that out? I know you know the answer, Nolan. Well, here's the, go ahead, Nolan, tell us why. Because financing is different for each person, and for some people it's even optional. Yeah, so he said financing is different for each person, and even for some people it's even optional. So what one person, I know people that get less than 3% on their short-term loan stuff with construction things and everything else. And it makes no sense for them to get it anywhere else, right? I, I know people that when you first get started, they're, or based on their situation, are going to pay 75 to 8% even when current rates are at 5 or 4 and, a, four and 3 quarters. Okay, so financing can vary dramatically, all right? So when we take the inverse, we take that net operating income and we divide it by the cap rate. That tells us how much value of real estate or the total portfolio value we need to have in today's dollars to accomplish our goal of 60000 a year. So we need to own $1,090,909 worth of rental real estate. Make sense? OK, so pretty simple. We get to that number. Now, they need to own that. They have $50,000. OK, we just talked about financing. We looked at our financing options, because we need to know what our options are. We have to have 25% down to be able to do it. 25% down of 1.09 million is $272,727. OK? You got 50. That's 5.45 times their current money that they have right now. 
And the other thing we need, it needs to be free and clear. So we can't just own the property and then have a $700,000 debt. We need to have it paid off, right? So we need to have it paid off in 35 years. So those are our variables. This is the equation we got to deal with. How do we solve that problem? Okay, so open up your case study. Let's go there. So, Nate, I'm going to kind of talk from here, okay? All right, so this is the summary. You guys see that all on the front page? This is, this is like getting all the answers to your test before we even look at it, right? But I'm going to go over the summary really quick, and then I'm going to show you how I came up with it, okay? So number one, here's our goal up here in the top left. See that one point, that $1,090,900 is what we need to do. We have $50,000 to start with, okay? On this master sheet, which you guys have a copy of it, just say master sheet property one. It's the next page under yours. And this has all the assumptions that we made. So I made some pretty quick and dirty things to, to make this all work, okay? So there's the money down. This is just a function of the, of the down payment. So 25%, they can buy a $200,000 property. I assumed an interest rate of 5 and, th and, and 5.375, okay? 30-year mortgage, and I fixed the payment. We're going to deal with residential property. That's what the monthly payment is. That's what the annual payment is, all right? Uh, I figured just to get a rental value, a three-bedroom, two-bath home, Appreciation rate, super, super, super important that you have some assumption in there for appreciation. The average appreciation rate over the last 80 years or so in Salt Lake Valley and in Utah was 3.5%. So I went slightly under that at 3. Okay? All right. Appreciation, by the way, is nothing more than a fancy word for inflation. Okay? Monthly rent, $1,350 according to today's numbers. This is a home that I would buy in like North and Rose Park area, Kearns, parts of West Valley, stuff like that, parts of Taylorsville, kind of uh, low, uh, lower cost areas, okay? Okay, so I figured out, okay, we don't want to manage it. We want this to be super long term. I don't want to get a call at midnight. I don't want to go clean out the toilet. So I put in management. So we have a company manage it. There's our taxes, there's our insurance. There's our maintenance, there's our capital improvements. Capital improvements is the money that you save to replace the roof or a furnace or a water heater, okay? Because I promise you, they go out. <laughs> you gotta maintain your property, all right? Maintenance is, hey, I got a leaky toilet, will you come fix it, right? All right, there's your total. This number is just a function of the percent to the value of the property. That made it easy for me to come up with assumptions on the other properties that we're going to buy in this scenario. All right. So we got our net operating income. On this deal that we bought, our cash flow annually is $1,525. That is like 120 bucks a month, $125 a month. Who's excited for that? It's, it represents literally a 3% return on your $50,000 investment. Well, I mean, All right, good answer. That's a very good answer because it is a good deal, and I'm going to show you why. Okay, so here's some of the other things. This debt analysis, this tells us what our principal reduction is. Okay, here's the thing. If you want... $5,000 a month. Okay, now with real estate, this is how it works. $5,000 a month. The principal never, ever gets depleted. In fact, not only does it not get depleted when you own real estate, it goes up in value every single year. Okay? And you always have that $5,000 free and clear all the time after all expenses, after everything. In order to do that, at the same time, how much money would we have to have in the market conservatively, Ryan, to be able to accomplish that goal? And I know you have a number in your head, so tell me what it is. I love it. As soon as you hit me with the question, like I, I like blacked out. So 
<laughs> ask me more time. Go ahead. Okay. So I'm just going to answer two because I'm not going to ask you again. So the, the, so the question, you would have to have about one and a half to two million dollars easily. Okay? Easily to be able to conservatively do it. Two million is probably a closer number that you would have to have to make that happen in any other type of thing. So, all right. So principal reduction, the beauty of it, in order to save $2 million over that amount of time, what do you have to do and how much would you have to save, okay? So think about that. Beauty of principal reduction is who's paying that principal reduction for you? Who's saving that money for you? Your tenant. You're not doing it, right? Every time that tenant works, they're working for you. That is the power of human capital, right? You're getting a little bit off of somebody else. Cash flow, who pays that cash flow for you? Your tenant. So that equals $3,500 a month from those two things. Your value, you have somebody paying for a property and, and taking care of it and everything, and they're there taking care of all of that. Who's creating that equity for you from the value? Your tenant, right? All right, tax benefits. So you get to depreciate real, a rental property on your taxes. It's one of the biggest benefits we have from a tax perspective. So I took a real benefit on this. On, on residential property, you can, you can depreciate it over 29 and a half years. Um, and so I took that and I figured a 25% tax bracket. So that's your real savings on your taxes. That's what you'd put in your pocket, 1271 a year. Accumula accumulated savings, what I did there is I just added up your um, cash flow and your tax benefits. I didn't count anything else on that. Your capturable equity. Okay, this is an important thing for me. I'm, I'm a big proponent of this. You don't have to use the equity in your, in your assets, but you damn well better have access to them, right? Because it's an opportunity cost problem. Most real estate investors are asset rich and cash poor. So you need to make sure you have access to that equity whenever possible. Doesn't mean you need to use it. You can use HELOC, lines of credit, whatever to do that. The total available funds that you have from that property, we got that. And then I have total equity plus your savings. So I figured you're gonna have, um, you've got, you're gonna be saving all of your cash flow and your tax benefits above and beyond. So those are some of the assumptions, all right? I want to show you something and tell me what you guys think. So if you kept this little house in Kearns, wherever you bought it, gross rents right now $13.50 a month. Everyone think that's realistic? Yeah? Okay. 30 years from now, you're going to be renting out that same home for about $3,200 a month. Everybody think that's realistic? It sounds crazy. It does. Totally sounds crazy. I got so my grandpa used to cut my hair, and he he lived he raised his family on a barber salary, and his house payment was never more than fifty bucks a month. And I when I had hair, and even when I was losing, he'd still cut it and be nice and massage my head, which was really cool. But anyway, I went there and I would talk to him, and he'd say, he'd he'd say, Aaron, what are you doing? I'd say, Hey, grandpa, I'm buying this property over here, and I did a lot of stuff around his area. Because um, I like the, he was in the Lower Sugar House area. And he's like, oh, really? Well, what's the, what is it? I said, oh, it's a two bedroom, one bath unit. He's like, what do you rent that out for? And I said, oh, seven fifty a month. And he'd say, holy smokes! I've never paid more than 50 bucks a month for my house. How on earth is anybody affording that? So, well, Grandpa, things have changed, right? So it is hard to tell, right? Here's the thing. Rental rates have surpassed inflation significantly by a more than 64% above and beyond current inflation rates. For sure, that property will be there that way in 30 years, okay? All right, so now we have all these assumptions. Let's look at this property. So what I did is this. In order to accomplish this, this plan and to do it very conservatively, we buy one property and we let it ride. We don't do anything else for five years. After five years, if you look at your master sheet, okay, and you look over to this total equity plus savings, right there is the number that we have, $103,856. So if you come over to, to here, 
This value is a function of that. Okay? So we're able to buy with that. We've got to put 25% down, right? So we're going to buy a $415,000 property. So that's represented right here. So here's what we have. When we first start, the, the, we're, gonna, we're not hitting our goal by $890,000 when we buy our first place. When we buy our second property in five years, we're still $812,000 behind. Why is that? Because your goal goes up every single year. It appreciates. So you've got to make that adjustment for inflation, right? So we need $812,000. Like, gal, I've been owning property for five years, and I'm still $800,000 away from my goal. All right, so let's keep going. So the third property, so we're going to, so what we do in year one, in the fifth year, we sell this property and we buy this one. So never do we own more than one property. That is also a very important point. So you don't feel overwhelmed like you have all kinds of property. All right? It's a very conservative plan. All right, so second year we buy this property, we go down the line, and our cash flow goes to $31.55 a year on our $100,000 investment. Who's excited about that? 3.1% return. Awesome. OK. So now we go to the third year. We're going to buy property number three. And here we are. Here's our equity on property number two. So after five years, let's go, oh, go over here. So year 10, now we have $259,000. $275. It has only taken us 10 years to almost reach the amount of money we needed in the beginning. Anybody excited yet? No? Not yet? Okay. We'll just keep going. We'll see what we got. So, all right. So, year three. So, that helps us buy a $900,000 property. You're feeling pretty good. Like, hey, we got a million dollar property. We're driving the most boring car on the planet. It doesn't have leather. It, in fact, it has a cassette tape, which my kids don't even know what is. And that's what we have in that car, all right? That's how boring our life is at this point. So here we go. And our cash flow goes to $6,979 a month for our $370,000 investment. Uh, a year, I mean, excuse me. That's pretty terrible, right? OK, so now this is where it starts to get interesting, though. Year 15. So at year 15, we're going to sell our property. This is property number, so at three, excuse me. Here we go, right there. We have $554,000. We're going to sell it. We're going to buy property number four. Property number four is right here. We're going to buy a $1.9 million property. At this point, the value. We now have beat our goal by $318,000. So at this point, we're done. We don't need to buy anything else. This is what our annual cash flow is every year. It's terrible, right? Still is just a terrible return on our money. But here we go. This is what we've got. Now let's look at this debt plan. So now we want to pay it off. And all I did on this debt plan, guys, and I can email this spreadsheet to anybody who wants it, all I did is I took just your normal payment, and I took all of your cash flow every year, and I put it towards your debt. That's it. I, didn't ex I, didn't ex I, didn't, I don't want you to, to save any more money. I don't want you to change your lifestyle. Just take your cash flow, put it towards it. This is what it does. At year 30, everything is paid off. Okay. So we're, we beat our goal by five years. The entire building is free and clear, 100%. Here's your cash flow after the payoff. $277,303 per year. Just so you know, I did this calculation. Your inflation adjusted cash flow to make $60,000 in 30 years needs to be $145,636 after 30 years. I did it only after 30. I didn't do it at 35. 35 would be a little higher. But 30 years, you'd have to make $145,000 a year to have the same amount as $5,000 a month in today's dollars. Okay. You beat your goal by $131,000 a year, which means instead of five, you pretty much have 10. We're $190,000 above and beyond what we thought we'd do. Now, how many people like the 3% return a year? That is the most boring real estate plan I've ever made, just so you know. 
but it works. And so that's, that's kind of the point is is with our plan, guys, when we build a strategy, depending on what you want, you don't have to do a lot to be very wealthy in real estate. Now, what if I could help you with one thing? Instead of doing it all on your own, which this plan would assume, you figure it all out, what if I could help you buy property at a 10% discount? Just 10. Just 10. Do you know what that would change on the plan? Probably shave five years off of that 15-year plan, or that 30-year plan, so 25 or whatever. What if I could help you buy property at a 15% discount, or a 20% or a discount, right? More than that, what if I could help you find a way to access more than 50,000, you can access 80,000 or 90,000? which I do every single day. Ask Nolan, ask Cody, ask Kelly. Every day I find it. What if I can help you do that? Now all of a sudden that gap becomes it's smaller, smaller, smaller. You can accomplish your goal in how much time? Now I told you my personal stuff, I went from negative $100,000, no cash, no credit, nothing, to $10 million of real estate today in an eight year period. So what if I could help you just get two million in an eight-year period? You accomplish that goal, or a million in five years, or whatever. You don't have to be that aggressive. Again, I have people who are very conservative. I have people who are aggressive as well. And the one thing that I do in this that my losses have taught me, so this is how we help, OK? Remember this and write this down. Every plan, every strategy has to have this component in it. Capital preservation first, return second. Every financial planner under the sun would tell you, God, if you could just eliminate the losses, how much you would make in the market. Pardon my French, but no shit, Sherlock. Like, that's easy math, right? But in real estate, the beauty of it is this. When you're invested in a property, even if you bought a property at the height at 2006, okay, and you lost all of that value and you kept the rents, the rentals, the rents and everything else, the cash flow, do you know what happened to rents in that time period? They were stagnant for a little while and then they started ticking up by 10% a year is what happened. So your cash flow started going through the roof, right? And you just held on and you held on and you held on and you held on. You're ahead of the game by a long shot today. That's what it is. That's what happened. And when you adjust it for inflation, we are actually 20% below what we should be at the peak of 2006. So what I'm trying to say is, again, you only lose money when you, lose, when you sell it, if you sell in a bad time, right? But that's the beauty of real estate. If it cash flows and you take care of it long term, if you set yourself up long term, you can withstand any economic storm. And if you don't want to take care of it, like I did, I used to do everything. I replaced carpet. I did, so the first fourplex I got, I bought, funny story. Now I can laugh about it. But OK, so it was a 4,000 square foot footprint. So there are 1,000 square foot units. And there's a, is a, about a five and a half, about almost six foot um, crawl space, high crawl space down in the, the whole thing. I bought the fourplex, closed on it, and the next, uh, two days later, I was down in that crawl space with a foot of water, as a foot of gray water. Um, so gray water is like from showers or sinks, things like that, okay? Hopefully none of the kids, well, Anyway, people pee in the shower all the time, so I don't know what I was in. But I was in it, and it was in February. All right? So anyway, I swear a little bit, as you guys can tell in my presentation. So I, uh, I'm just cussing up a storm, cleaning this out. And I call the seller, and I'm like, you dirty rat. What did you sell me? Da, 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 da. He came over, and he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. And he gave me $500. 
And I'm like, you dirty rat. Like, I was there for a week. And I couldn't figure out where it was coming from until I was sucking out water. And I saw from a pipe all this water start dropping down. And I'm like, what in the heck? And I walk over there, and I figure out where it's at, and it's from a tenant's shower. It wasn't even connected to the sewer at all. <laughs> so anyway, that was my first fourplex. So I did all of that work. I remodeled that entire property by myself and a, and a few of uh, my brother Jonathan's help and everything else. But So I did everything. The first time I replaced the sink, it took me, what was it, two and a half hours to replace the sink that would take a normal contractor like an hour, 45 minutes, something like that. Okay, so if you don't want to do all that, which I totally get, I totally get that, that's why you build a plan for management. Have a management company take care of it, have your expenses go up and drop your return. Now do this calculation. If you manage the property yourself, if you're getting 3% on, on it, you pretty much doubled your return on your cash on cash return, right? To a 6% return. But if you take that spreadsheet of mine and you take that out, you'll see that that doesn't make that big of a difference overall. Exactly. We are responsible. This is a little uh, toot of my own horn and a shoe for my, a little plug for my company. So just hire us and we'll take care of it for you, all right? But anyway, but you can hire. You don't have to do it yourself, but if you want to, do it yourself. It's perfectly fine. Anyway, you build your strategy. You know what you can do. How, we, how I help more than anything is I help you avoid the pitfalls that you don't see by not buying hundreds of properties before, by not losing everything and having to restart and do it again, you don't know what you don't know. And if you think you do, you're the wrong person to be with me anyway, frankly. So that's how we help. And we make our money when you buy property or you have us manage it. We never charge anything up front, and that's what we do. So, that's what I would encourage you to do. Number one, the take homes for today. How to choose a good property, have a good plan. So how do you have a good plan? How far in the future do you need to think? Michael? Thank you. You gotta be old. You gotta see yourself with the cane, with the walker, with the whatever, and you gotta picture yourself in different scenarios. How do you want your life to be? Nothing drives me more crazy when people say, I don't know, I guess I'll be happy. You guess? Are you kidding me? You guess you're going to be happy? What the hell? I don't want to guess I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be happy or I'm not, period. But damn it, I'm going to decide between those two options. It's not going to be a guess, right? So you've got to have a plan. You've got to think long, long term. How to make money, I've just proven that. You can have the most boring strategy on the planet and be a multi-millionaire, all right? And live a great, great life. How to finance all of your stuff? Easy. Conventional financing, seller financing, I have done a lot of that in my career and a lot of creative stuff, no one knows, and we can help you with all of that. Partners, it all depends. Whether you want them, whether you need them or not, okay? And how we help, all right? So, can def define it, we'll ignore that. Okay, so one last thing I want to talk about. In a seller's market, which is what this is, this is what happens, you need to be careful. Real estate, everybody's excited about real estate, and things are selling, prices are high, and everything else. People get overexcited during this time. The best thing you can do, sometimes the best deals are the ones you never bought. Number one, once you have a plan, be patient, okay? The properties will come, we'll be able to find something. You want to be careful you're not overpaying for a property. That can happen. Okay, it all comes down to calculating it like an investment. You want to be careful you're not emotionally buying, getting in love with the property. Okay, and you want to be careful that we are not sticking to the plan. This happens all the time. Hey, Aaron, I know that uh, my plan is this, but this property, gal, it just seems great. It's on this, and I think it's going to grow. You know, Eagle Mountain is exploding right now, and da 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 And I'll say, yeah, but it's not the plan. Yeah, but, but, but. But you'll be bankrupt in four years if you don't follow the plan, right? That's what we got to do. Let's follow the plan. 
at least get the first one on the plan. Then we can talk about the second one. All right, using unrealistic or, or unreasonable data or numbers. I could make that spreadsheet say whatever I wanted it to, right? And I have talked myself into bad deals by saying, you know what, I think I could tweak the numbers by this. I think I could get this much rent. I think I could do that. What I do now is I go off of worst case scenario numbers. So I know I can hit that. And the best story I have for this is this. So a gentleman here that lives right up in this neighborhood, his name is Tom Lloyd, okay? Scott, you know him very well. Um, I have an immense amount of respect for Tom. Uh, in fact, I've called him my unofficial mentor for years. <laughs> Because I have, uh, and he helped me during my most difficult time in real estate. He helped me significantly and has helped me out throughout the years ever since then. Anyway, um, Tom started with nothing and he started buying duplexes, flipping duplexes, that kind of stuff. And he grew and grew and grew and he bought it. He had like 300 apartment units at one time, sold them all, and he, and he developed all the Union Park office buildings and kind of been, been an office real estate guy for years and years and years. I don't know what he's worth, but he's worth a lot of money, all right? And so in, he was telling me a story about when he started in the 80s, right before the savings and loan crisis, to develop these office buildings. So at that time, his plan was to build six-level buildings. Well, the bank came to him and said, hey, Tom, why don't you build 12-story buildings, and we'll loan you 100% of the extra cost, so no more down payment, and we'll make it non-recourse. For those of you who don't know, that's a big deal. That means he could be at a very much higher leverage point, have twice the square footage, twice the value of property, and if he loses the property, they can't go after any of his personal assets. Okay, at that time, there were 10 people like him trying to do it's the same thing, doing these office parks, okay? And he told me at the end of the year, there were two left. And the reason why is because of leverage. And he told me this, and I've never forgot it. He said, Aaron, real estate is a leverage game. He said, it's not he who leverages the most wins, it's he who leverages the smartest wins. And what he did in that scenario, he told the bank no. And the reason why, which is from a real estate perspective, if anybody understands this, and that when you get to know and you start to understand it more, you'll get to know why this is so hard to say no to that he knew that at six stories, he could keep the building at least 60% occupied to at least cover his payment. That was his worst case scenario. But with 12 stories, he didn't know if he could do that. It takes a lot of discipline to say no, right? And to stick to the plan. But everybody who does, like Tom, ends up doing extremely well in overall, okay? And that's the same with Ryan and his business. He tells me, Aaron, stick to the plan, because I get mad if I lose a little bit. You know, and so, but it's true, because his stuff works too, right? All right, so here's what we've got. So that's where you want to be careful. Now, so we're here to help. We meet with people one-on-one. -on -one. We can make plans for you. We can help you with all scenarios, all right? And um, again, for those of you who have met with me, I always start with the first thing, right? We just met. What was the first thing, the homework I told you guys? What were they? When do you want to start? When do you want to end? Uh, when you stop. Okay. When do you want to start, right? Where do you want to end? So what's your end goal? And how much do you want to start with, right? And they'll ask a bunch of questions on what their assets are, and it's none of your business, so I'm not, I'm not going to talk about them at all. But um, we always do the same thing because it's very important. We need to know where you, where you want to end up. So. And again, thanks for coming tonight, guys. Thank you. We'll be having another one in uh, June time. Cody will send that out. Okay, everybody should register with Cody. Make sure he's got your information. And come meet with us. Let's talk again. All right? Thank you very much.